बोल देना हेलो एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू दैक्टो कनेक्ट वेबिनार दिस इज द ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ वेबिनार द थर्ड पार्ट ऑफ द ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ वेबिनार एंड वी बीन स्पीकिंग फॉर द लास्ट कपल ऑफ वीक्स हेलो एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू दैक्टो कनेक्ट वेबिनार दिस इज द ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ वेबिनार द थर्ड पार्ट ऑफ द ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ वेबिनार अभी स्पीकिंग फॉर द लास्ट कपल ऑफ वीक्स टेक्नोलॉजीज इन कार्डियोलॉजी so we have been working on this webinar for the past one month now we already done two parts of it and this is going to be the third and concluding part of this webinar uh, to speak on the topic obviously like the last two webinars we have with us my esteemed colleague and teacher uh, colonel dr anil dhal sir welcome dr dhal sir thank you nilesh we uh, get to be here so uh, dr dhal is is a veteran of the armed forces and he's now been been in private practice for the last 8 to 10 years He's he's headed the department of cardio cardiology at Artemis Max Delhi Heart and Lung Institute and presently heading cardiology at Janakpuri Super Specialty Hospital. He's also the, has his private practice at Gurugram. And uh, today he's going to be talking about the emerging technologies in in cardiology and how it's affected the treatment in COVID, post COVID, uh, the use of AI in cardiology and many other topics on on the same lines. So, Dr. Uh, Anil, if you could just tell us what you're going to be talking about and share your screen with that. All right. So, with your permission, I'm going to start by diving in to the to the slides because uh, it's as uh, with the Nilesh's warning that this is going to be the last of the set. I don't have the liberty of extending it any further. So, uh, we are we are going to discuss. emerging technologies and emerging directions in cardiovascular medicine if we will recap we did a little bit about preventive cardiology and then we did something about interventional cardiology but today we are going to focus on the technological advances which happened because mankind was hit by not really an asteroid but uh, a small thing not as big as an asteroid but a virus which uh, collective weight of which was 2 grams and it brought the entire human race to its knees and it made us look again and think and introspect as to the way we are headed so there were directional changes in our practices there the trajectories have to be reinvented although we may not have taken a lot of lessons from it because we are reluctant to change but it means that we can now incorporate a lot of technologies we should know how to use or how not to use big data we should know how to use or how not to use very big words like artificial intelligence virtual reality augmented reality heart failure has actually exploded this is possibly the decade and the future is that for for advances in heart failure whether it be in terms of the foundation of four drugs the way we evaluate the devices uh, a lot of progress has been made on conduction system pacing and and physiologic pacing and we also have now experienced from the first successful although it was only for about 2 months successful zero transplant in the field of of transplant biology and i will conclude with practice points which we have learned from the recently concluded esc 2022 which was the first meeting after 2 years in person over to covid so what did humanity learn 1918 we had so called spanish flu not really nothing to do with spain nothing to do with spaniards but this was the time that the first world war had kind of ended 
ships had brought troops from various parts and and this led to a two years of at least three waves of a lot of people getting infected remember 1918 no pcr no diagnosis no ct scan no assessment of of any of the tools that we have no vaccines furthermore no paxlovid none of the other agents available the only thing which was available to us was appropriate behavior isolation and protective measures and this actually taught us something initially but mankind did not learn and just about 101 years later it was left to this great person an ophthalmologist practicing in the city of Wuhan who noticed that a lot of patients would come to him with a pneumonia would deteriorate very fast and some of them would succumb and he felt that this, there could be some normal agent which is, which is responsible. Various claims, counterclaims that this was a biologic agent which was there, which had leaked out of the, the labs in Wuhan, a lot of accusations that some governments were trying to promote it, uh, actually trying to think that this was a zoonotic disease which had accidentally got a, uh, uh, into a human infection, we, 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 all of us went through, all countries in the world, went through lockdowns, went through isolation, went through economic deprivation. We had to alter the way we think about life, not just medicine, not just because of this disease. Why did cardiovascular physicians get involved? Because this virus, or the normal coronavirus, attaches itself to the ACE2 receptor. And this is the entry point. So a lot of patients initially who succumbed to this virus were patients who are having cardiovascular risk factors. They were hypertensive, diabetic, smokers. They were elderly, and this, which is very easily understood because those are the people who are going to be immunocompromised and are otherwise at high risk for, for succumbing to this infection. But what people felt, could it be the angiotensin receptor blockade or the ACE inhibition that was being given to these patients? Was that responsible? We did not know. So we waded through like a blind man buff for a lot of time. We all understood that there was initially a viral response, then there was a pulmonary phase, and then there was actually a host response, which could lead to hyperinflammatory syndrome. And, and this, uh, by a variety of different mechanisms, either by direct cardiotoxicity, or by the hypoxemia, or by the cytokine storm, or by uh, endothelitis and a coagulopathy, which could create either manifesting as acute coronary syndrome, myocarditis, venous thromboembolism, or heart failure and cardiogenic shock or arrhythmias, there were a lot of cardiovascular manifestations. But initially, what people died from was a kind of uh, um, acute lung injury and also a cytokine storm, which, which led people to be placed on ventilation and so on and so forth. But when we looked at the cardiovascular complications, some of them were late manifestations, ventricular tachycardia, fibrillation, you could have inflammations which could have myocardial inflammations up to one month. There were cases reported anecdotally and serially studied of sudden death because of direct involvement of myocardium by virus, cytokine storms, arrhythmic events. Like I said, there was endothelitis and a procoagulant state with arterial thrombosis, venous thrombosis, crazy thrombosis, thrombosis which we had never, like the likes of which we had never seen, and some autonomic manifestations like unexplained bradycardia, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, patient would stand up and get tachycardia. So all this was cardiovascular complications. And because of the, depending on the susceptibility, the severity, the systemic inflammation, and some of the underlying comorbidities, these patients presented 
in a variety of different fashions. There would be, like I said, there would be potential risks like age, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, smokers, diabetics, renal, uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, and there would be a variety of different manifestations. The mechanisms of coagulopathy, the pathogenesis of thrombosis, were related to a lot of risk factors, like which could be just uh, the inflammatory risk factors. There could be hemostatic abnormalities with intravascular coagulopathy, pulmonary microthrombi, and increase of cardiac biomarkers. And this could manifest with venous or arterial thrombosis, or even set up a triggered enzyme cascade system and have a disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. All these patients prophylactically, even without evidence initially, started getting monitored for these factors. We would look at D-dimers, we would look at lymphopenia, we would look at inflammatory cytokines as markers, we would look at CRP and IL-6, and we would look at D-dimers, look at the platelets. And if the D-dimers were elevated, we started using novel oral anticoagulation. We also realized that COVID-19 could directly exacerbate cardiovascular conditions, and, and this could lead to more acute MI or strokes. But in the initial circumstance, what had happened, the fear of contagion kept people away from calling emergency services, ambulances, visiting emergency rooms, the logistic difficulties because they could not actually get transport to come to the emergency rooms, the hesitation of the healthcare staff to take on cases led to a lot of people either dying unsung or dying with, with STEMIs or acute, micro, or, or, or acute coronary syndromes or complications of STEMIs even at home without our realizing. Although initially, the first few weeks, because the numbers decreased, people actually were wondering if there was a protective benefit of the COVID virus. It was not really true. So whether it was by creating cytokine storms, myocarditis, whether by creating more venous or arterial thrombosis, or a, a, a viral infiltration, or some of the drugs which were tried, there were many cardiac injuries, which could be either hyperinflammatory, which could be hypoxemic, direct damage, or microvascular damage. And this was different over a period of time. Because as the disease evolved from a viral phase to a pulmonary phase to an inflammatory phase or to a recovery phase, we had different manifestations. What else did we see? For example, look at this female in her 1950s, moderate disease. A CT was done to rule out pulmonary embolism. And what does it show? Uh, it actually showed that this patient who had shortness of breath had global LV dysfunction. When MRIs were done, they, they actually showed that there was the LGE actually showed with T2 mapping and T1 mapping that there was a myocardial infiltration by the virus or a actual myocarditis. In sportsmen, it was estimated where serial MRIs were being done. Otherwise, it was difficult to do MRIs or cardiac MRIs, especially in these patients, because you have to sanitize the equipment. You have to, you have to make sure that the, the patient itself was not a nidus for spreading contagion. And these patients, but when athletes or competitive sportsmen were actually studied as high as 70 to 75% of people who had active COVID infections did have, even in the follow-up, some amount of myocardial injury and inflammation suggestive of myocarditis. Well, by workouts tried, we know that there could be endothelial injury, hypercoagulability, and abnormal blood flow. So all of leading to a pro-thrombotic condition. And this could this pro-thrombotic condition further caused different problems to these patients. Beyond this, which could be arterial or venous, and if you did have venous thrombi, then you could have pulmonary embolism. So you could have myopericarditis, you could have myocardial edema, and then we realize something even more. Once the, once the vaccines came, some of them had myopericarditis in response uh, to some of the mRNA vaccines. So these patients could present with a direct myocardial injury like myocarditis or cardiogenic shock or a Takasuba picture, pulmonary embolism, multi-organ failure, abnormal rhythms, or unexplained hypotension or just hypoxemia. Even in the recovered patients, we realized that imaging abnormalities varied from zero to 80%. And again, 
because there was no baseline imaging in many of these cases, and it was not possible to uh, all comers imaging uh, this disease, which had unknown long-term consequences. New terminologies were, were invented, long COVID. And therefore, when we actually put them, we also realized that during this period, what happened socially, there were lockdowns. Lockdowns meant people were not exercising. They were not moving out. Many different social engagements started. You started ordering in food through delivery boys or Swiggies or Zomatos. People actually had even their own uh, social behavior changed to a pro-thrombotic behavior or, um, or which increased the worsened the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, or the standard cardiovascular risk factors. Like I said, mRNA vaccines, especially in the US and Europe, uh, we did not have mRNA vaccines, but the, we could, they could, there were reports of myopericarditis following them. Long COVID, which are symptoms existing beyond four weeks, continue to have very, very protein manifestations from lipidema to uh, um, uh, dyspnea, to chest pain, to fatigue, to headaches, it was just about everything could be labeled as uh, in the symptom spectrum of long COVID. But by and by and large, chest pain, unexplained chest pain, unexplained dyspnea, palpitations, brain fog, fatigue, and there were no treatments for this. There was nothing great that we could offer. We had only got to do symptomatic treatment. Suppose somebody had orthostatic hypotension, we could treat it. We, we tried non-selective beta blockers in case, uh, or, or ivabradine in case the tachycardia was distressing. But by and large, we had to tell people, this too shall pass. There were early rehabilitation, counter maneuvers, compression stockings, which happened. I mentioned partial orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. We are still seeing some of these because this was a sustained increase in heart rate by 30 beats within 10 minutes of standing or following a head up till ta table test. And, and therefore, this is something which we realize that unexplained tachycardia should not really bother you unless it bothers the patient. Like I said, because of the fear of contagion, there were collateral damages and there was at least an increase of cardiovascular mortality, either out of hospital mortality, out of hospital cardiac arrest, or less presentation with acute coronary syndrome, uh, device implantations were delayed, or heart failure hospitalizations decreased, and therefore the cardiovascular mortality increased. So how did we need to react to this? Well, everybody uh, is today wired up with a mobile phone, right? And we all thought that we will use these tools in terms of medical practice, in terms of medical education. Uh, people like, like this platform and, and Nilesh, uh, encouraged us to have more webinars and more exchange of ideas with other people so that we, the process of continuing medical education continue. But we need to rethink the hospital for the next pandemic. Are we ready? Were we ready? Are we going to be ready? We, we all uh, realized that we needed a different kind of air exchange in the hospital. We needed different kinds of protected corridors. And what happened was because it was a great unequalizer showing that there was inequitable access to women, elderly, poor, less, uh, less privileged people. And it actually worsened the digital divide. So we needed to actually improve this. And one of the ways by which we did it was to adjust to the new normal was to actually have telemedicine. And if we see the waves of the COVID-19 pandemic, what are the waves? The first wave was a wave of immediate mortality and morbidity of COVID-19. At this time, cardiovascular mortality appeared to decrease because people did not report. The second wave was impact of resource restriction on urgent non-COVID conditions. People's pacemaker implants were postponed. People's TAVI was postponed. Bypass surgery was postponed. The first wave tail had a post-ICU recovery. And then the third wave, we impacted interrupted care on chronic conditions. And by the fourth wave, there was enough psychic trauma, mental illness, economic injury, and burnouts which had happened. So when we say, what did COVID teach us? 
What did this two grams of collective weight of novel coronavirus do to us? We should actually reevaluate not just the healthcare delivery model, but the true value of care. Not just I should do something because I can do it, but should I do it? How much will it benefit? And maybe 70% of outpatient care could actually become virtual. We could actually collect data on, on absolutely mature touch points by which we could interact with patients, may not be through a direct physical interaction. Uh, hello, auntie, how are you? Hello, uncle, how are you? But the same, hello, uncle, how are you? Or hello, sir, how are you? Could be done through while looking at a screen and both parties actually accustomed to doing this. This is possibly good for the long term. Why? Because 30% of even conventional inpatient pay care could become outpatient care. And the hospitals should primarily be reserved for intensive care, diagnostics, emergencies, uh, and procedures. Uh, because, because when we do this, then we are actually judiciously utilizing the hospital resources. Otherwise, many people come, especially to government facilities, only to collect medicines, which is completely and totally inappropriate, or they need to consult their physician, which even, even that could be done on a virtual basis or a hybrid basis. But one thing we learned, and that was that if this allowed people to pick up their phones and speak to their doctor, they tended to do it without much seriousness and without using proper sensors, without sharing the data in an efficient workflow, the virtual visits just became glorified phone con conversations. So we actually need, needed a compatibility with an electronic medical report. We needed to have a, a randomized control trial showing that it benefited us in outcomes. We needed to have a clinically acceptable workflow. There should be reasonable reimbursement for this. And it should be something which is not just has a return on investment, but has to be con conducted with complete maturity by both parties, not just the patient, by all stakeholders, the patient, the caregiver, the care provider, as well as the physician, should all actually uh, pitch in to understand that this is a, a modality by which we can save the transport uh, to uh, the the uh, the, the uh, going to the hospital, spending time in the traffic, waiting in the doctor's clinic, or if the doctor's involved in a procedure, you could get a time, you could speak to the, the physician concerned, the physician could evaluate you, and it enabled a little bit faster access. It allowed social distancing without time wasting with better continuity of care. And even for health professionals, it allowed us to you maintain social distancing uh, with reasonable quality of care, and we could adopt newer technologies. Cardiovascular medicine is actually eminently suitable for, for telemedicine practice. Why? Because we have a limited set of emergencies. You could have chest pain. You could have somebody who's become breathless. You could have somebody who's, uh, uh, who's got accelerated hypertension, all of which can be measured. The clinical data set, the history has only five cardinal symptoms. What are they? Dyspnea, angina, palpitation, fatigue, and syncope. And there are salient features of general examination, which can be easily recorded and transmitted and shared. Weight, heart rate, respiratory. We can use the six minute walk test. We can take the blood pressure and sitting and standing. Well, you can make the patient actually look for pedal edema. If somebody is a diabetic, he can keep a glucometer at home and with one drop of blood can tell you his random sugar. And, and this was actually a game changer, not just, the, not just getting uh, an automated BP instrument for, for blood pressure measurement, but getting the heart rate and oxygenation through a, a saturation from a pulse oximeter was brilliant. So actually, we, we had to see, would it lead to an exponential increase in telehealth? Well, it did for some time, although old habits die hard and all the people have moved to their shopping from an in-store experience to an Amazon or a Flipkart experience. But many people want to come back and see their physicians because there were many barriers to this developing because virtual visits could be without proper sensors and, and good data sharing could be just glorified phone conversations. 
everybody tended to take them very, very casually. Physicians would answer them while having their meals. Patients would, would ring up while driving a car. Uh, it was inappropriate. So I think that one needs to be as serious about a teleconsult as, in fact, even more in a physical consult, you might pick up a few things when you are seeing a patient. But in a teleconsult, you need to be completely sharp and look for those for, for, for meaningful interaction, meaningful history taking, meaningful uh, uh, understanding of what, uh, what data you can collect, what integrated sensor strategy you have, what suite of sensors is available. Because the holy grail will be eventually to use artificial intelligence, predictive analytics. But in India, we don't, even in hospitals, we, our EMR is actually a sham. How many hospitals use EPIC? I mean, 70% of hospitals in, in, in the United States use a system called EPIC, which is, which, is, which is actually cumbersome, but makes life easy because many touch points of data are collected for a long term. But here in our country, if somebody says they have EMR, it basically means that they have, they scan the, 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 the physical prescriptions or the hand little prescription. And physicians of my vintage are also responsible because we are not very comfortable uh, in, in typing or we are not very comfortable in keying in data. We still like to use our pens, I think when I write. And, and, and therefore it becomes, there's a lot of reticence to change. And we cannot create an easy workflow when this has not really happened. We actually needed an RCT with, with, with impaction of clinical outcomes. And we also needed that there should be appropriate monetization and reimbursement. Because many patients think that they only had a conversation with their physician. They, they didn't really consult him. And why the hell should they contribute uh, you know, for his time? So the next generation of students who are currently uh, who are much smarter than us guys, and those guys are very you know they 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 even romance on their phones and and uh, uh, in our days there was nothing like LOL uh, but uh, or TTYL but those are the guys who can actually use these tools even better. So this led on in March of 2020 to the country uh, the evolving what are called the telemedicine practice guidelines. And like I said, the guidelines were, were very good because they offered a platform. They said the same professional ethical norms and standards, including fee for service, be observed. Seriousness is mandatory. The judgment for escalation in an emergency, it is the physician's responsibility. And also the caregiver must be honest. Many, many patients in our country do not like to tell their complete history, uh, not realizing that a, that a physician has to work on data provided. Uh, the identity uh, uh, establishment was essential. Record keeping is mandatory. Uh, you could upload, uh, upload investigation, but it should not be that you get a, a PDF from a lab and the next thing you do is you forward it to the physician. He does not know whose PDF it is with the scum. Uh, the diagnosis in an e-prescription was mandatory and there should be a seamless escalation when you need to visit an ER or when you need to be seen physically. There were many exclusions. There was no specification of hardware. It was platform agnostic. But the guidelines were clear that no surgical or invasive procedures could be done. The guidelines did not cover consultations outside the boundaries of the nation. There were issues of network and digital literacy. There was a dependent on the reliability of the symptom analyzer or presenter because they, those, uh, those uh, the patient, the caregiver, very often gave their own interpretation of the, of the clinical data and you never got raw data. And many people thought it was like a video game because actually digital friendly technology is still work in progress. Well, you can transmit a DICOM3 data, which is the industry standard for media transfer, but uploading, storage, retrieval, bandwidth, large files. But the biggest challenge I feel was because we all use non-standard reporting formats. My language is not the same as Nilesh's. Nilesh's language is not the same as mine. When I'm talking about the same thing, we, when we read an ECG, we all read it together. But when we write a report, we write it differently. When we write, see an angiogram, we, we know what we are seeing. But when we write the report, we write it differently. When we see an echo report, we write it differently. So we need to develop structured disease reporting formats. Mind you, 
this will come at a price because we'll need to actually key in a lot more touch points. We will be seeing fewer patients and our throughput will decrease initially till such time we have collected our own data. And once we have these AI tools, we must remember that artificial intelligence should be used as a slave, not as a master, because data confidentiality must be preserved. Although e-pharmacies have been bought, sold, merged, and acquired, uh, it's still not, we still don't have a government paper on it. And, and really, uh, there was a time that high courts before uh, March of 2020, high courts were giving judgments against physicians for practicing in a teleformat. But, but today, because it's become legal tender, a lot of e-pharmacies have taken to saying, okay, we'll get your clinical consultation for free. Now, that's also kind of inappropriate. Further, the data that emerges should, be, should not be put to inappropriate use by any of these people who have access to data. Well, we also had the development of, of robotic instrumentation. And by this, we, we actually had robotic PCI, which could be attached. There was a company called Corindas, which has been bought by Siemens. And uh, Dr. Tejas uh, actually took permission under special license to, to perform it even remotely, although it's not currently legal. Uh, you can't do it from a distance. You have to be around. And in the US, there's a lot of work on robotic PCI and even acute stroke intervention because there are not many qualified people to do it. So all this is something which, which uh, we, can, we can progress further. We, we all know that we can also attach uh, with an angiogram and an IFR, co-registration can be done. Uh, so future angioplasties may actually have be more robotic assisted and there may be a different workflow. Now, when we examine a patient clinically, we all know that we, we tend to do a general examination or a systemic examination. And, and when, we, uh, when we do this, uh, there, are, there, there are things which we see like the jugular venous pulse. And the practice of cardiology used to be pretty exciting. I guess that's why the smartest guys a couple of generations before me actually did cardiology because they could get access to patients and examine them like this. But Lennox changed all of that by introducing the stethoscope. And, and digital technologies have now taken away that joy as well, because, because now it's become almost a virtual examination. With many Internet of Things devices, you can get temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, saturation. You can do haptic learning. You can use digital stethoscopes. You can actually even have a holographic interface. A point of care ultrasound should have been the greatest advantage during the COVID. But unfortunately, because of a legislative problems in our country, which are actually social problems, and the presence of the PCP and DT Act, we could not really use it. So novel technologies are being used, but we need good basic architecture. We need to keep record keeping of large data uh, because the data acquisition technician capability is sus suspect. And this is actually the future because if you get big data, otherwise you can have problems and we will discuss it. Because even look at a small thing. We, we looked at clinical examination. We, we, we can look at ECG. Johannes Bosha, who is one of Eintoven's teachers, had actually suggested that when Eintoven has his physiology lab and Eintoven's first ECG machine was like a full room. And he said that you could use Alexander Graham Bell's telephone lines to link uh, the hospital to the physiology lab. And if you see this happened, uh, and uh, the first time an ECG was transmitted over telephone was on 7th of February, 1906. And, and, and we now have ECG being transmitted even from space. So I think there are a lot, it's very easy. Uh, we, we have we put, we've asked companies to put uh, uh, SIM cards into ECG machines for easy transmission. We have devices which are, which are patch devices, which can be used very easily. Again, oxygenation or pulse oximeter, Takuya Ayoragi, who, who actually made the pulse oximeter and millions of pulse oximeters were sold during and helped us in clinical care during COVID, himself succumbed to the coronavirus at 84. ECG, well, you look at the cardiac system, you can get ECG and, and even the Apple Watch. I've actually had an, an octogenarian auntie who, I, who, who rang up and said that I'm having some dizziness and, and through our Apple Watch transmitted, and I felt that this is complete heart block. We can pick up uh, atrial fibrillation, and, and we can even use these technologies to, to actually pick up better diagnosis and even virtual stethoscopes. 
I, I, dis, I, I discuss point of care ultrasound. We now have handheld devices which can be connected to our mobile phones. And uh, we have many offerings which are now available. And actually, if we use them well, we can, we can use them for comprehensive cardiovascular evaluation, whether it is to look for right heart failure. You can see uh, the image shows that there is RARB dilatation with tricuspid regurgitation, and there is pleural effusion with edema. You can also not just do an, uh, do an echo, but you can also look at lung water. And lung water became uh, a very, the lung water cascade helped us understand what were curly A, curly B lines and, and look at pleural effusion and consolidation. And in times of COVID, to distinguish between pulmonary edema and to distinguish between acute lung injury or pneumonia, we could use ultrasound. You could even connect this and have an improvised tele-ICU, which is just using an iPad and some of these devices, you don't need high-end devices, which can actually be done. Well, on the move, you could use wearable monitoring devices, which could monitor a lot of things on an ambulatory basis by wristwatches, smartphones, patches, headbands, eye necklaces, glasses. The Imperial College actually had a Band-Aid, which could record vital signs, blood pressure, oxygenation, a CGM-like blood glucose, and a metabolic panel. And the Internet of Things could bring a lot of this together with many sensors, which could be jewelry, clothing, headset, eyewear, wristwear, and, and using accelerometric devices. We have some very, very fancy companies from India, which have, which have made accelerometric devices for even monitoring. And, and we are actually conducting a few projects with them and getting reasonable data for, for this. A lot of biosensing variables in the form of clothing or accessories could be used. But there are some issues we all know when Dick Cheney uh, was to undergo an ICD implantation. He was vice president of the United States. Uh, the, the security service actually asked for the Bluetooth to be switched off because otherwise somebody could remotely uh, do bad things to him. Uh, well, the same thing also exists with home monitoring. There are some cybersecurity issues. We all know that in India, the STEMI project in many states has started with Tamil Nadu, very well functioning in Goa uh, and many other states wherein ECGs could be seamlessly transmitted and response systems initiated. It can be used for data collection. It can be used for social determinants of health, and we will discuss it. It can be used for elderly care, and we can integrate data and use it for big data and artificial intelligence. Because telehealth is a new era. It's uh, There are many Indian uh, possibilities, but none really are perfect. Because some of these aggregators own media, and they are run by non-physicians, and they have their own payment gateways, and there can be some issues by their presence. Because remember, even these platforms have liability for inappropriate data misuse, and, and the, the guidelines are very clear. So the World Heart Federation has actually given a roadmap for incorporation, and, and this is one of the great ways of ensuring inclusivity of healthcare so that we can, we can promote universal health service coverage and empower patients and providers. They looked at various roadblocks, found different solutions, in the terms of leadership, governance, legislation, investment, strategy, infrastructure, having interoperability. And, and this in our country, we all know that the Ayushman Health Mission has been a very, very ambitious project. And the National Digital Health Mission is actually something which is, uh, which, which is really ambitious. And if we have good structured disease reporting, and if we all cooperate, we can have a great ecosystem by which we can finally have our own not just efficient, affordable, timely, inclusive, and safe healthcare, but every stakeholder can be benefited and we can have our own data. So my wish list is that we should improve our EMR or MRD. Uh, we should need new tools like voice to type text, handwriting to type text, touch screen, drop down menus, or with seamless DICOM upload, because handwriting is not always legible or standard. Abbreviations are never standard. Uh, and we need to make it legally binding and, and integrate it with clinical decision-making support tools. Now, when it comes to big data, we, 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 we need to understand big data a little better. But the same thing has been applied by the European society. They're trying to overcome it. And they're trying to build it into the curriculum to make future visits better and easier. So what happens to big data? What happens to artificial intelligence? You remember during the pandemic, two major publications, both regarding COVID, both with the leading author being a very, very senior respected um, uh, cardiovascular physician who is the William Harvey, distinguished William Harvey professor of cardiology 
at Howard completely above board in terms of his credibility and, and uh, integrity. He published data which came from a company called Surgisphere on two aspects of COVID. One was the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs and the other was a political issue regarding, regarding hydroxychloroquine. Unfortunately, when this got challenged, the, both the papers had to be retracted because the big data itself was suspect. The dose of hydroxychloroquine, which was being, which was talked about, was not available in the continents that it had been, it had been so-called uh, discussed. And that is a fear when we are going to do big data analytics and look at artificial intelligence. So there was an old statement, garbage in, garbage out. We are as good as what we key in. So what about augmented reality and virtual reality? They are both very important and they can complement traditional learning methods and they can, they can actually uh, overcome a lot of technical challenges in terms of case planning. You can have immersive virtual reality by teaching patients. We can do augmented reality. We actually, um, you, can, you can do a 3D uh, printing and, and plan difficult devices and see how it can be done. And this is uh, uh, augmented reality, ECMO training. You can, you can see uh, people are using Google lenses or, or uh, the, uh, the Microsoft HoloLens project, even for patient education, this can be used. And uh, this, this can even for rehabilitation, cardiac rehabilitation can be done using these tools. But then let me come back to cardiology. Let me come back to heart failure, because if we do everything, we finally have to have patients who are in heart failure. And this is a decade of after COVID, we are going to be left with, and after all our advances in interventional cardiology and all our advances in structural uh, um, heart interventions, uh, we understand that heart failure itself is a progressive condition. Uh, and, and this actually, it is not just uh, something for which in our undergrad days, all that we needed to give a patient with heart failure was a LASIX. And LASIX is an acronym for something which lasts six hours, lasts six hours. So we, we used to give a diuretic, a water pill, the patient would feel better and that was all right. But the mortality of an untreated heart failure is the same as an untreated stage four lung cancer. So people are going to die because they're going to have a baseline heart failure risk with residual heart failure risk, which is going to have interspersed with infections and arrhythmias and, and other ischemic events and go to a advanced heart failure risk. Now, over the last 20 years, we've had fantastic improvements in our pharmacological treatment, in our imaging understanding of heart failure. And the new treatment algorithms con contain what are called the foundational four treatments, the foundational four arms for the treatment of heart failure. What are they? Beta blocks, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. We, we, can, we, we can use uh, ARNIs or angiotensin receptor blockers uh, or ACE inhibitors, which will be, which will be third. And recently, we have all realized the value of SGLT2 inhibitors, which started off as an anti-diabetic, but today has become a foundational core of the, the heart failure regime. In fact, the treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors could be agnostic of whether there is preserved or reduced ejection fraction. And this has been a game changer because we all know that all the other drugs did not, other than decongestion with, with diuretics, did not really work in heart failure. In people, uh, in people who cannot tolerate um, drugs uh, like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or ARNIs, we can use a vasodilating combination of hydralazine and sorbide dinitrate. And uh, if, if your heart rate, despite beta blockers, maximum tolerated beta blockers is still above 70, you can add ibogradine, which is a funny sodium blocking agent. So this was our historical approach, which is linear in nature from ACE inhibitors, ARB, beta blockers, MRA, and ARNI. But now we have a st new strategic direction because we tend to now, rather than having a, a slowly upscaling our up titrating, we can have rapid sequencing of our heart failure, reduced ejection fraction uh, um, treatment. And we can actually start the foundational four pillars of heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, which is uh, RAS inhibition, beta blockers, MRA, and HLT2 inhibitors. 
And we have a lot of support for initiation of these heart failure therapies in the hospital itself, whether it is the pioneer heart failure with ARNI or solo waste from sotagliflozine or impulse from empagliflozine. And, and we, we are also understanding this a little better because we used to first classify, incidentally, ejection fraction is a very funny thing. The term was introduced by a resident in cardiology by the name of Stuart Bartle. And Stuart Bartle actually called it ejected fraction. But in the one year that he, uh, he actually published the first, first paper on ejected fraction, there were so many thousand papers on ejection fraction that he gave up cardiology and took to psychiatry. But today we define heart failure because heart failure is a symptom complex. But we end with elevated biomarkers and we realize that uh, it can be a confounder because it does not always correlate with ejection fraction. So we have heart failure reduced ejection fraction. You have heart failure with mildly reduced or mid-range ejection fraction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and you can also have improvement in ejection fraction. So SGLT2 inhibition provides benefit across the ejection fraction spe spectrum. But our treatment for, for heart failure initiation can actually be guided by the phenotype that we are dealing with. Depending on the heart rate, we can, we can use different drugs depending on on whether there is atrial fibrillation, whether there is low blood pressure, whether there is CKD, whether there are other things which are happening. So majorly we can think of four things, blood pressure, heart rate, presence of CKD, uh, um, and uh, um, hyperkalemia, or presence of absence of atrial fibrillation. Because if we do not take appropriate action, there will be repeated heart failure events which will further cause a reduced uh, cardiac function and lead to worsening heart failure. So selected patients should be considered for ivabradine. We now have newer drugs for worsening heart failure despite foundational poor, like versiguat, digoxin or digitoxin may be in smaller doses, may be making a comeback. And in appropriate patients, we have hydralogene, isosorbide, dinitrate combination. Then we have newer drugs which are knocking on our door, like we have omicamptive, which is a positive inotropic agent. For the first time, we may actually have a drug which works. We use iron because a lot of these patients have tissue iron deficiency. So we estimate the ferritin and transferrin saturation and appropriately use intravenous iron. The current intravenous iron, especially ferricarboxy maltose, is very easy to take. And, and that can be given to these patients. And in patients, uh, you can use in worsening heart failure, you have vericiguat, which is an oral uh, soluble guanine cyclase stimulator or a direct myosin activator for omicamptive. And these are newer drugs. So a lot of, we also have a lot of work which is going on in non-steroidal MRAs like phenarenanone, which don't have adverse anti-androgenic effects. And uh, then we, we can move further to patients who have left bundle branch block morphology, wide QRS, we can actually, after optimization, we can consider who are suitable for CRT uh, uh, with or without a defibrillator, which is, which is the way we would look at. Now, when we look at heart failure preserved ejection fraction, well, it has, again, many phenotypes. It is a very heterogeneous disease. It can happen with hypertension, with coronary artery disease. It can be just cardiometabolic. It can happen with pulmonary hypertension. It can happen with CKD or in... in, in High ejection fraction, if you do a global longitudinal strain and you come out with cherry on top and a pickle sparing, it could be amyloid. So there are a lot of evolving phenotypes of heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Remember, 30% of them will, will actually be deficient in BNP. You may not even have an elevated NT-pro BNP. So you need to be conscious of the diagnosis and have a, a low threshold to diagnose it. You can have a phenotypic approach to treating it, depending on what you are dealing with. Are you dealing with lung congestion, chronotropic incompetence, pulmonary hypertension, skeletal muscle weakness, atrial fibrillation? And so you can make sure different things in this data actually work. Now, heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, left bundle branch morphology, wide QRS, beyond 160 in, in males, beyond 130 in females, does benefit clearly with with cardiac resynchronization therapy and does poorly with RV apical pacing. So if you do just RV apical pacing, you'll have a remodeling. Uh, but CRT itself has a 30% non-responders. In addition, CRT is less effective for non-left bundle branch block and is not indicated for normal or low normal. So we looked at alternate sites of pacing by which we could pace 
one point and have both the ventricles actually working in a more synchronized fashion. So we looked at the LV septum, looked at the his bundle, looked at the RV septum and looked at the left bundle. So here we had possibilities of his bundle pacing, uh, which was selective or non-selective or left bundle pacing, which went through the septum. And this is the new concept of conduction system pacing, which has really evolved. Even when we are doing CRT, we can do a his optimized uh, uh, CRT or we can do a left bundle optimized CRT to improve uh, the, the efficacy and to decrease the non-responders. Now, there are various parameters which are used. This is a his bundle pacing and you can actually see uh, this is a left bundle pacing which is much easier and is now becoming almost standard of care. And here is a patient uh, who after uh, uh, the application of his bundle pacing has QRS has gone from 160 to, to about 90. So these are the lead positions in his bundle and left bundle pacing because, because conventional biventricular pacing, which we used to do now, will still have non-responders and may not be applicable for QRS, which is not really in the range of 140, 150, 160 uh, uh, milliseconds. So this is a really an advance, and I don't want to bore you with technicalities, but remember, uh, biventricular pacing is a great advance, but um, e even today, if we want to do a conduction system pacing, it takes away the bad things of a right ventricular apical pacing. And if you actually have a patient who has either failed a CRT, then we can upgrade to a hot CRT or a lot CRT, and even prophylactically, we can offer hot CRT, a lot CRT for patient being benefited. Furthermore, we can stimulate in the absolute refractory period by doing what is called a cardiac contractility modulation. We can further go ahead and do some interatrial shunt devices. Well, really, even, even our uh, durable mechanical support with left LVSS devices has actually improved. And these devices are today there is less thrombosis, there is less infections, they, and they can be used largely as even as destination therapy because the cardiac transplant numbers, also because of our own hesitation, have not really grown. Even in the United States, uh, we, the, the wait list is long and, and we need to have, we need to maximize post-transplant outcomes. So you can use cardiopulmonary exercise testing to refine the candidate prognosis, but, but all this has led to something unique which happened this year. And that was uh, that there was actually something which had been which had been tried by Dr. Barua in India in the 90s. Uh, he had tried to do a zero transplant, but this time they used, uh, and there were a lot of previous here, you can see a reference to Dr. Barua in 1997, uh, who actually used um, uh, uh, a pig heart in, uh, in, in, a, in a patient, but with, um, but the patient did not survive and Dr. Barua got arrested and this, uh, but there was no regulatory approval for this, but there was no way by which this, this had actually been prepared. And he just thought that standard uh, uh, rejection um, uh, prevention would do it. But today with the CRISPR technology, which is clustered regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats, uh, they have been used, and we all know that the CRISPR technology, the Cas9 technology, for which in 2020 the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was given to Emmanuel Chapantia and Jennifer Dudna. Uh, this led to our understanding, and a lot of immunological and technical barriers were actually broken down. Now, these, these pigs which were taken were selected. They, they were went through, uh, firstly, all the porcine and, and, uh, endogenous retroviruses were cleaved. They were cloned again and again to make sure uh, that they had no beta herpes 2 virus or lymphotropic herpes virus or hepatitis E virus. But then they were, uh, they, they were, there was gene editing done in the recipient to ensure that he would actually be able to, to take this transplant and to prevent uh, the hyperacute rejection and to prevent vascular xenograft rejection, to prevent coagulation dysregulation and also uh, they targeted immunosuppression. And David Bennett was the patient in whom this was used. Unfortunately, he probably, despite all what was tried, uh, he did survive over two and a half months. This was, remember, this was a patient who was on a VA ECMO. He was uh, in an end stage heart disease. He, he was on uh, um, already on a balloon pump. 
and he knew that there was nothing more which was going to happen to him. So he virtually offered his body to science and, and uh, unfortunately when he was lost, it is presumed that it could be a cytomegalovirus infection which actually took him. So, but CRISPR technology has been a game changer. And I probably pointed out this slide in one, I think, Emerging Technologies Part 2. And really, there's a company called Verve, which, which actually made an intravenous infusion, which is going to be one injection, which will turn off the PCSK9 gene and will have a 70% LDL reduction lifelong. And in the recently concluded uh, ESC meeting, I mean, Kera presented their their new technology that was uh, Verb 101, but now they pre presented Verb 201. They, that in 101, they had done something using CRISPR technology for switching on the PCSK9 gene. Now they have done something to actually inactivate the angiopoietin 3. And this is, again, a drug which may be great potential. So the like I said, uh, having covered some of the technological achievements, the European Society this year saw new guidelines. Cardio-oncology, cardio-obstetrics are the new fields in medicine, in, in cardiology, in cardiovascular medicine, because we are realizing that there is lots more to be understood, lots more needs to be done. We have a whole host of monoclonal antibodies which are being used in oncology. Some of them have bad effects on the heart and they need to be known. Our approach to ventricular arrhythmias, prevention of sudden death, has led to a new guideline this time, especially a patient comes to you with some VPCs. You need to know that when there's more than 10% VPC density, which are the VPCs which are amenable to maybe uh, uh, an ablation and which are the VPCs for which you actually uh, need to consider uh, more treatments. So uh, even non-cardiac surgery, the cardiovascular assessment led to a new guideline. Pulmonary hypertension has revised definitions in new guidelines. In the next three or four minutes, I'll give you a snapshot of some of the things which came up. The Invictus trial, which is very proudly presented by Ganesh Kartikeyan of Holland Institute of Medical Sciences, actually showed that rivaroxaban does not hold ground against vitamin K antagonists for rheumatic atrial fibrillation. Now, a lot of people say, I told you so. But, you know, and there are many reasons why this happens. There is atrial cardiomyopathy, which is happening in these patients. And, and this is beyond just what was there, but it was uh, when the results came, it kind of established what had happened with the realigned data a few years ago. The SECURE trial, which again had a lot of Indian patients in it, was uh, uh, using a polypill containing aspirin, uh, um, uh, and it was the first randomized trial on recurrent cardiovascular events in post-MI patients. Remember, this was not a primary prevention trial, and the study enrolled patients within six months of having an MI, and they showed that uh, aspirin, statin, and an ACE inhibitor did work. A very, very interesting and a very complicated and a very, um, shall I say, a confusing issue was studied by the time trial because, because the chronobiology of hypertension led people to give uh, antihypertensives at different times of day. Some people would give it in the, I used to give it with Betty earlier, then there was a Japanese trial, uh, which actually suggested that it was best given at night. And then there we had Fiji, uh, a, a Spanish trial, which said it would be guessed way best given in the morning. So actually, uh, this was tested for five, five and a half years. Uh, this was tested in the time trial. And, and really, uh, they said that taking medication in the evening was not harmful. And, and there was actually no difference between what time of the day you take medicines. So I, I think uh, logic wins and uh, chronobiology need not be such a major uh, contradiction to our, to our use of drugs. The ADVOR trial, uh, now we all know that we are using a variety of different diuretics and we all we know that there, are, uh, there is a global dobutamine shortage which is being faced by the world today. But among diuretics for sequential nephronal blockade, the use of a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which is by and large being left to the ophthalmologist in glaucoma, and which is being used for preventing hyoptative pharmidema, an intravenous form of acetazolamide was used in the ADVOR trial, and and there uh, these patients uh, were, were, were actually it was successful. The role of reduction or using allopurinol in patients with coronary artery disease did not show any benefit. Well. 
Uh, there was a Me Too trial, and even in mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction heart failure, a, a uh, depagliflozine SGL2 inhibitors won. So this kind of resonated what we had learned with the Emperor Preserve, and, and we are going to really look at this even more in times to come, because now this is not just a foundational four, it is a foundational four which is, which is agnostic to the ejection fraction itself. Well, the perspective trial told us that cucubitinal valzerton does not cause cognitive dysfunction in patients uh, with either mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction. And use of artificial intelligence in terms of, of using AI in Echolab showed that uh, the initial assessment did not really, the, the difference was only about 7%, uh, so, which is, which is uh, which could be considered that, that it has some role. The frame AMI, and I'm not going to discuss FFR again, but uh, the frame AMI was for using FFR um, was thought to be superior uh, to um, uh, the routine angiographic based evaluation. And there is a recent data called from Flavor, which has been published last week in the New England Journal, which actually compared FFR with IVIS, but we need to understand the nuances. I had gone through this in greater detail in part two. But the landmark trial was presented by my friend, Devaka Pereira. And, and he actually collected data, which is based on the stitch and stitches trial. I had referred to this trial that this data is going to be forthcoming when we had done the part two of the presentation. And this trial actually looked at stable patients with ischemic LV dysfunction with the sole aim of providing prognostic benefit. And it excluded patients with limiting angina, recent ACS, and, and tried to see whether in these patients will PCI benefit. About 700 patients with ejection fraction less than 35%, uh, a very high extensive coronary artery disease and a high uh, basis jeopardy score with at least four dysfunctional myocardial segments which could be revascularized were studied. Remember in the STITCH trial, we found that if you offered surgery in LV dysfunction with reasonable epicardial targets there, are, and the same data was continued in the STITCHES trial, you would have benefit even if you did not demonstrate viability. But this trial has been an eye open, and it means that you need to look very carefully at who has benefited and who has not. And in Divaka's own words, it is many interviews, which I, on an email, I told him that your interview sounded more like an interrogation. Uh, he, he has said that the data which is available has been provided to him only one week prior to the publication, because this is the original data. They will now do the post hocs and they do the subgroup analysis, and we hope to learn which patients benefited and which did not. It is not a nail in the coffin of stable coronary syndrome angioplasty, no, because we'll still need to see the crossovers, and that is something which, uh, which we'll need to be seen over a period of time. The DAN canvas was a very interesting study because all corporate hospitals, all labs tell you that you do cardiovascular screening, including cardiac imaging, blood pressure measurement, blood tests, for 60 to 65 to 70 year old people. And this actually seven cardiovascular conditions and, and appropriate treatment. Uh, so there was an increase in use of antithrombotic agents, lipid lowering agents, and even elective aortic aneurysm repair. So maybe they, this is the first time that this is counterintuitive, that you actually have data which supports screening. And it is data which supports screening because these are about 47,000 people who were randomized one is to two, they were men. And they were randomized to doing a non-contrast CT, uh, ankle brachial index, blood test to identify high cholesterol, diabetes and prophylactic treatment. And maybe there will be a place for, for patients who are Dan Canvas-like and we'll be able to screen them better. So it's all about the patients from the first cypress tent to the first tower, we now have 100 year olds who are undergoing procedures, but remember that our patients are the point of care. And with all this data and all this knowledge, I come back to Nilesh and I come back to you all to use it judiciously. I can't answer all questions. I, I'm sure, I hope I have provoked you into thinking through these series of three talks. And if you'd like more of this, please get in touch with Nilesh or with me and we'd probably be delighted to offer. If there are any questions today, I would welcome them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patient listening. It's been over an hour that I have been speaking.
yes, back sir. to you. I'll stop sharing. Back yes. to you, Nitesh. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that talk. It's going to take my team a couple of days at least to go through all the three webinars and pick up the points of learning to write it into a blog. So I'm sure you've given them some really, really hard work for the coming week. But it's a pleasure, sir, listening to the whole gems that you have shared with us over the past one month, over the past three weeks. So I just have one question for you once. Uh, we have talked about so many new technologies, so many new drugs, so many new protocols which have come. Uh, what do you think are the main technologies and new treatments which have been picked up very fast by the practitioners and which are the ones which are going to take some time? So again, ease of use is what gets treatments and technologies into mainstream. So if you were to ask me, I would say one of the easiest technologies which became mainstream was the use of the pulse oximeter. The other was the use of the mobile phone, you know, WhatsApps and, and platforms like this. So using telemedicine, this was easy. So it got used. In clinical practice, despite the expense, drugs like sacubitril valsartan, drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors, patients came back and told us that despite the expense, give us these drugs. We are feeling so much better. We are feeling so much better. Then there was an understanding and to overcome the initial reticence about say statins, you know, the patients would come back. There was not a nocebo effect, but as we understood it better, we knew that we needed to give statins for primary, secondary or tertiary prevention. So today we have a lot of options. We have non-statin options. We have ezetimibe, bempedoic acid. We have ma, ma, EPA, ma, we have uh, icosapentithyl. We have PCSK9 inhibition, and we will probably have inclisiran available. And if the work technologies were to come, maybe we'll just need one injection and get sorted out for a lifetime. How expensive it is, it's difficult. But there will be technologies which will be too expensive to ever, ever, ever see the light of day. There was a drug called canacunimab. It is, an, it is a monoclonal antibody, anti-inflammatory, used by the Harvard group. Uh, and and uh, uh, they actually tried to prevent not just coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis, but also malignancies because they felt that all of them had uh, inflammatory basis, but costs about three lakhs a month. Now that's something, and for life, you don't know what is the side effect. Second thing is we need to know, be conscious about new therapies because the, the bane of evidence-based medicine is that we need to understand data better. The boon of evidence-based medicine is that we or not just need to establish efficacy, we also need to establish safety. And that is a real boon and it has to be proven through not just one trial, but not just collective clinical experience, not just registries, but repeated trials so that we can identify that this treatment works. So there are a lot of things which are going to be game changers. We, we, are, we are moving from, for example, from CRT to hot CRT, lot CRT. We are, we are decreasing our lot of primary prevention, ICD implants. Uh, we, are, we are doing far more TAVIs that become so commonplace today. We are, we, are, we are doing complex PCI when indicated, but we are asking ourselves, is it indicated or not indicated? Primary PCI, acute coronary syndrome need to be done. A real game changer in interventional cardiology, for example, use of shockwave, IVL technology, real game changer. Why? Very small learning curve, very good results. So, but expense, that's the flip side. So everything needs to be evaluated and everything has its own destiny. And, and, and let's see what time tells us. Time teaches us. Right, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, we heard you speak about robotic surgeries. Uh, personally, I think robotic surgery should be uh, used a lot because especially since we have a dearth of specialists across the country. What are your uh, views, personal views on use of robotic surgeries in cardiology? Okay. Now, what does a robot do which we can't do? Well? Everybody's hands do shake a little. This is called jitter, even in, a, even in an open surgical procedure. So if you have a standard protocol, like a shop floor, you're making a car, you're doing something, there's a standard protocol, then robotic work eliminates the jitter. But it needs to have a person on ground. Now, what you're talking about and what I discussed was not legal, was remote robotic work. 
So I, I, I'm when we are discussing here the Da Vinci system, the Da Vinci Robo in use in, in it's become now very commonly used in say prostatic surgery. It has become very commonly used even in, in some people in cardiac surgery or aortic surgery. But to to make sure that when does it enter interventional work, I still think there's more work to be done. Although the people who are using it are very very happy. Despite the premium, despite the cost and the premium per case that they're going to pay, uh, it saves them radiation. Nobody has ever thought about the ergonomic and the stochastic and non-stochastic radiation effects on the healthcare workers, on, on you, me, and anybody else who's in the cat lab. Now, that can be reduced by, by using the robot. So I think this is still work in progress. We need to get there. But to think that bots will replace us and, and decide everything, uh, well, it's also very dangerous. Don't forget Space Odyssey 2000. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how many of our audience have actually see, seen that movie, but uh, yeah, that was a good uh, analogy. So, uh, thank you, sir. I think that's all, all the questions I had for you. And uh, I think we have all enjoyed this. I would like to thank the audience for giving another Sunday for us. And they've been very patient uh, and sacrificed three Sundays over the past one month for us. So thank you, audience, and thank you, Dr. Neil Dalsar. Thanks again. Thank you, Nilesh, and thank you all, and stay safe, and take care. Right, sir. Jai Hind.